Insurance fraud in the UK costs more than £1.2 billion a year. That's more than £3 million a day. Deliberate crashes, bogus personal injuries, even phantom pets. The fraudsters are risking more and more to make a quick killing, and every year it's adding more than £50 to your insurance bill. But insurers are fighting back, exposing a fraudulent claim every five minutes. Armed with the latest fraud-busting technology, including covert surveillance systems, sophisticated data analysis techniques, and specially trained fraud investigators. They're catching these chances red-handed. Instead of getting away with it, more and more of these fraudsters are being caught out and claimed and shamed. Today on Claimed and Shamed, a father and son who get caught up in a police chase find themselves on the wrong side of the law after making bogus claims. The police had witnessed the collision um, and both police officers confirmed that there had been no one in the parked vehicles. Lockdown Britain, when streets across the country were deserted. So how did two riders still manage to collide on a street in Croydon? People were told to stay at home. So the likelihood of two motorbikes coming together at 8.30 in the morning was of great concern to us. And caught on camera, five young men claiming for serious injuries are called out by damning CCTV footage. You can clearly see that the individuals are not shunted around, they're not thrown forward, backwards. In fact, they hardly notice that the collision's taken place. There are more than 40 million licensed vehicles here in the UK. With that many cars, motorbikes, buses and HGVs on the road, it's no wonder that fraud committed against motor policies is the most common type of insurance fraud, valued by the industry at more than £600 million. Today on Claimed and Shamed, we'll look at some of the ploys that scammers use to try to cheat money out of motor policies. From overblowing repair bills, faking higher car charges, and of course, fabricating personal injuries. Like in our first case. Getting caught up in a police chase as a bystander can be a frightening and potentially dangerous experience. This case came to the attention of Rebecca Hyten at Plexus Law, when a father and his 16-year-old son put in a claim after their car was hit by a driver being pursued by police officers in Halifax. They had been sat, packed up outside the home address when a vehicle being chased by the police came round the corner and crashed into their packed vehicle. The smash shunted their car into other parked cars, and both men were jolted in their seats. Thankfully, they were wearing seat belts. The suspected criminal then made a run for it. The driver who was being pursued by the police was chased on foot and arrested um, a short distance away. The dramatic incident had left its mark on these bystanders. Their car had been written off, and both men say they'd sustained injuries and been left in pain. They were in no rush to get a payout, though. The claim came in to us about three years after the accident had happened when the claimants issued legal proceedings. They'd submitted their claim just in the nick of time, as court proceedings have to be issued within three years of the date an injury is sustained. The son was now 19, but seemed to remember the incident vividly. He claimed that he had been sat in the rear passenger seat and was shunted by the impact, causing him whiplash injuries to his neck, upper back and shoulder. He recalled that two days after the accident, the pain was getting worse, so he'd seen his GP and had been advised to take painkillers. His dad was also claiming for injuries and for the damage to his car. The adult driver claimed for the total loss of his vehicle. He claimed for the cost of a higher vehicle while his 
vehicle was declared a total loss and he also claimed for personal injuries. The men were claiming a total of £15,000. A claim for such a large amount, so long after the event, would have to be investigated. Rebecca and her team started by looking at the medical evidence. They discovered that both men had seen an expert two years after the accident, but had chosen not to submit their claim until a year later. During that assessment, the son had claimed he'd suffered from whiplash, struggled to lift heavy objects, and had had difficulty sleeping. He also told the doctor what had happened immediately after the accident. In his medical examination, the young claimant stated that he had been seen by police and that he had then got a lift home. The father, too, shared vivid memories of the incident, despite the fact that two years had now passed. The adult driver claimed that he was sat in the vehicle, seat belted. The impact shunted him forwards and backwards but didn't cause the airbags to deploy. He told the doctor that he hadn't needed a lift home. His injuries were remarkably similar to his son's. He also claimed that he had suffered sleep restrictions, which had lasted for a couple of weeks. He also said that his ability to lift heavy items had been restricted for at least a year. Despite the delay in submitting the claim and the similarities between their injuries, this accident seemed genuine to Rebecca. But she still felt she needed independent corroboration. However, the other driver was otherwise occupied. We had been unable to discuss the circumstances with the driver who was in prison. So at that stage, we didn't know whether the claimants had been occupant within their vehicle. Rebecca decided to start filling in the blanks by carrying out background searches into all three men, and she came up trumps. We identified that the um, at-fault driver lived on the same street, and when we looked more closely, it was um, diagonally opposite the claimant's address, so we assumed that they would probably have at least been known to each other. They were all neighbours, all living on the street where the pursuit took place which begged another question. The younger claimant had said that he had got a lift home from the accident, but the accident had happened outside his home address. And there was something else that was niggling Rebecca. It was just a little bit odd that people would be sat seat belted outside their home address. Most people tend to just get out of their car and go into the house when they get home. This was suspicious, so Rebecca turned to the witnesses that should be the most reliable of all. Knowing that the at-fault driver had been arrested at the scene, I anticipated that there would be a police report into this incident. In the meantime, Rebecca needed to prepare for the court case, so asked the claimants for further information. In the face of these multiple requests, both men dropped their claims. Seven days after the claimants discontinued, I received a copy of the police report. It was damning. This confirmed that two police had witnessed the collision, and both police officers confirmed that there had been no one in the parked vehicles. Presented with this vital evidence, Rebecca knew for sure that this was a false claim. The men couldn't have been injured as a result of the collision. Rebecca's team wanted these men to be held accountable for their actions. We decided to issue an application for a finding of fundamental dishonesty, which would enable us to recover the costs of defending the claim. The case was heard at Bradford County Court. Only Dad turned up. The adult claimant agreed that the claim had been fundamentally dishonest and agreed to pay back the costs of defending the claim. Despite going to ground, the son didn't get away with it either. The younger claimant didn't attend or respond in any way to the allegation, um, but the court was satisfied on the evidence before it that the younger claimant's claim had also been dishonest. 
Father and son paid a high price for their lies. They were ordered to pay £12,500 in costs. To completely fabricate a claim is pretty audacious, given that they weren't anywhere near their vehicle when the accident occurred. Later, double trouble for a cabbie claiming thousands for a replacement car, when investigators find his dates just don't add up. 13 of the 36 days hire presented to ourselves were for a vehicle that was being hired elsewhere. What is obviously clear is that one vehicle cannot be hired to two people at the same time. The global COVID-19 pandemic changed all our lives and for some had tragic consequences. Whilst those on the front line continued to work to keep the country going, most of us were told to stay at home. And for some scammers, with time on their hands, this was an opportunity to cook up creative motor insurance claims, like in our next case. The 23rd of March, 2020, will go down in the history books. This was the day the UK entered its first ever national COVID lockdown. The following weeks saw planes grounded, playgrounds locked, and streets eerily empty. Yet early in the morning of the 3rd of April, just 12 days into the lockdown, when people had been told to stay at home unless their journey was essential, a young builder in his 20s was out and about, riding his motorbike, when he was involved in a crash with another bike. The claimant alleged that he was driving down a road in Croydon in the morning. The insured had pulled out of a side road and collided with the rear of his motorcycle. Victoria Wallace is head of fraud at Zego, a specialist insurer which provides cover for a range of vehicles from scooters to vans to taxis. The company insured the motorbike belonging to the policyholder who'd caused the accident and the claimant he'd hit had put in a large claim. The claim was worth £130,000 and consisted of injury, vehicle damage and storage. He said that he had suffered injuries to the lower part of his body. This sizeable figure raised quite a few eyebrows at Zego. It did not seem proportional to what happened in the accident. A claim of this magnitude would always warrant a second look but Victoria was particularly concerned about this case. She wanted to know what the biker had been up to driving around Croydon in the middle of a national lockdown, when the streets were practically deserted and only those in essential jobs should have been out. The claimant had provided his occupation as a builder, and we were told at the time that we were not to travel unless it was essential. People were told to stay at home, so the likelihood of two motorbikes coming together at 8.30 in the morning was of great concern to us. Adding to Victoria's unease was the fact that Zigo's policyholder had taken out his insurance cover just days before the unfortunate accident. It's concerning that the customer had purchased the policy just four days before the accident, and it's indicated that the claim could potentially be staged or contrived. He was also avoiding any kind of contact with his insurer often is seen in stage contrived accidents. If a customer is not cooperating, then they could be hiding something. The initial concerns that we found led us to believe or suspect that the accident had not happened. Now suspecting that both motorcyclists may have staged this crash with the intention of submitting bogus claims, Victoria and her team stepped up the investigation, starting with background checks on the policyholder. It transpired he'd been busy leaving a trail of evidence behind him. Our inquiries led us to look into the insured's telephone number. We identified that several accounts were linked to this telephone number, and across these accounts, names, date of birth addresses were inconsistent, and documentation provided was also inconsistent. Just a couple of days before the accident, the policyholder had tried out different combinations of supposed personal information to get the best possible quote. We suspect that the insured was trying to obtain a policy for a reduced premium and or was declined. Victoria suspected the details he gave when he bought his policy were fake and, had he told the truth, he wouldn't have got any cover at all. 
Next, she turned the spotlight onto the other biker who was making the claim. She asked an engineer to examine his motorcycle. Due to COVID, this had to be done remotely. The rider sent in five photos of the damage to his bike, but the images did nothing to help his case. When the claimant submitted his claim, he advised to us that the damage to his motorbike was to the rear. When we received his engineering evidence, the engineer that had reviewed the documents advised that the damage was in fact to the side. At this point, we had inconsistencies between what the claimant had said and his own engineering evidence. He hadn't been able to keep his story straight when it came to his injuries either. When the claimant spoke with his medical expert, he advised that he had suffered injuries to his left shoulder and left leg which was inconsistent with the injuries described in his first notification. This change in account wasn't the only troubling matter in the man's paperwork. Victoria also uncovered information that suggested he couldn't have been that badly hurt. In his claims notification form, he advised that no police attended the scene and no ambulance attended the scene. He had no time off work and he had not attended the hospital, which was concerning given that he had suffered alleged lower bodily injuries. Next, Victoria turned her attention to the history of both bikes, the policyholders and the claimants. What she discovered about the two vehicles was just as shady as the information she'd found out about their owners. When taking a look into the policyholder, we had a look into his vehicle history. An MOT from 2019 showed that the vehicle had done 27,000 miles. A year later, the vehicle had done 20,000 miles, a discrepancy of 7,000. The mileage going down could be explained by an assumption that the bike had been tampered with. The claimant's motorbike had a questionable history too. We also identified that the insured's vehicle had changed hands nine times over five years. This claim was looking decidedly shaky. Then Victoria struck on a piece of information that proved to be the nail in the coffin for this pair of bikers. She found they already knew each other before the crash. Searches into the insured and the claimant revealed that on the electoral roll, these people had both lived together at the same time. Having this piece of evidence was the silver bullet for us, showing a link between the parties. The case was now a slam dunk as far as Victoria was concerned. She had the evidence to prove that the accident had been staged. There was no way Zigo was settling, but it seemed the claimant still had his heart set on his £130,000. Claimant and his legal representatives decided to issue court proceedings. We issued a strong defence to say that we were not going to pay this claim. We detailed all of our concerns and provided these to the claimant. Upon receipt of these, the claimant made an offer to discontinue his claim. Just like that, the motorcyclist wanted to drop his claim but Victoria wasn't going to let that happen. Because a lot of time and money had been spent on investigating this claim, this wasn't an option for us. So we went back to the claimant and advised him that he could walk away if he paid our costs. The motorcyclist agreed to pay back £7,000 in monthly instalments of £100. And there was a further consequence for the man. The claimant was also added to a national database, which will affect his ability to obtain insurance in the future. Victoria's amazed that these people ever thought they'd get away with it. What stuck out most to me about this claim was how brazen the insured and the claimant were. They had audacity to not even hide the links between them. We see this as a huge win for us, £130,000 claim not paid. For passengers travelling by road, buses and coaches are the safest mode of transport. Yet despite their excellent safety record, scammers still think these supersized vehicles are easy pickings for a quick buck. Chances should watch out though, as many bus companies have wised up to their shenanigans and have taken steps to protect themselves from bogus claims. Vehicles operated by First Bus carry hundreds of thousands of people every day and are fitted with CCTV to help keep both drivers and passengers safe. The footage is also invaluable to First Bus's Julie Randall when she sets about validating claims, like in this next case. 
One of our buses had just serviced the bus stop. Um, they were just getting ready to move forward, but accidentally put the bus in reverse, and unfortunately, the bus collided with the bus that was behind. As is standard procedure, the drivers of both vehicles involved checked that all their passengers were OK. Many of them said they hadn't even noticed the collision, but it seemed there was somebody who made it known that he had. One of the passengers went up to our driver and asked him to take his details down. He said, I got five grand for that last time. I want you to record my details, please. Um, the driver was quite surprised because this guy obviously wasn't injured. The two bus drivers reported the accident to First Bus, both saying the impact had been minor and that the bus that had caused the accident had been reversing at very low speed. CCTV from both vehicles had captured the incident and backed up their accounts. What happened next came as a shock. Two weeks after the accident, we received claims in from four passengers that were on the top deck of our bus. Uh, ten months later, we received another one, which was really surprising. It was, it was such a minor collision. The five claimants were all young males, and four of them were students. They said it had been a nasty crash which had left them badly hurt. All five passengers alleged that the impact was severe enough that they all jolted in their seats. They claimed they were injured, um, they sustained injuries to the neck, to the shoulders, to the phoratic spine, to their lower back, uh, and they were extremely severe. And they also sustained travel anxiety and even traumatic shock. The five young men claimed the accident had had a significant impact on their quality of life. As well as the injuries being extremely painful, they also alleged that they had problems with their studies, their sleep pattern was disturbed, they had problems walking, going to the gym and even playing football. The young men's claims were worth a significant amount due to the severity of their injuries. Had the claims been successful, uh, they would have been worth in the region of £25,000. This would be made up of their injuries and, of course, their legal fees. From the off, Julie and her team weren't convinced that they should pay out, as the details in the claims didn't tally with what their own employees had told them about the accident. The allegations made that they were jolted backwards and forwards in their seat, that it was a severe accident, did not match up with our driver's report. It was a very minor incident, a very minor movement. In fact, the passengers didn't even know it happened at first. Many of those on the bus had been unaware anything had even happened. It was odd that, of all the passengers on board, only these five individuals had been affected. What was surprising is that all of the passengers were young males. They were all young, fit and healthy. Um, highly unlikely any of them could have been injured in such a minor accident. Julie suspected they'd colluded to come up with the plan to put in a claim together. It was clear that the passengers knew each other. Three of them had even gone through the same solicitors. Convinced she was dealing with a series of bogus claims, Julie set about scrutinising the evidence, starting with the medical records the young men's solicitors had supplied. What she read didn't put her mind at ease. What was surprising is that all five claimants felt the need to have medical advice um, and they self-medicated, but not one of them sought extra treatments such as physiotherapy, which you would expect if your injuries are that severe. One of the passengers had even told his GP that he'd been thrown into his seat during the collision. Julie needed to determine whether there was any truth in what these young men were claiming, and she had a surefire way of finding out. It was time to re-examine the CCTV footage. When we received the medical evidence, we pulled up our CCTV footage again, and we were trying to look at the allegations made by the claimants compared to what the CCTV showed. This time, Julie dug out the footage from the top deck to see if the minor bump could really have caused those serious injuries. This camera shows the moment the two buses collided, but here, on the top deck, not a single person noticed. You can clearly see that the individuals are not shunted around, they're not thrown forward, backwards. In fact, they hardly notice that the collision's taken place, which was surprising considering they were alleging they had severe injuries. The CCTV confirmed that all five of the young men's accounts of the accident were categorically untrue. This was the key piece of evidence Julie needed to prove their claims were bogus. CCTV, of course, plays an important role in our investigations. You cannot avoid the cameras. You cannot argue with the cameras. Cameras are the best eyewitness. With this ace up her sleeve, 
Julie got in touch with the five claimants' solicitors, telling them she wasn't prepared to pay out. She also disclosed the CCTV evidence, assuming that would mark the end of the matter. But she was wrong. Not long after we denied all five claims, we received county court proceedings. They wanted us to go to court. Before the case got to trial, two of the young men got cold feet and dropped their claims. The other three still wanted their day in court, but they too got the jitters at the last minute. Julie didn't think they should get away with it and asked the judge to go ahead with the case. The judge reviewed the CCTV footage and was of the same mind as us. There was no movement. In fact, she couldn't even see when the collision had occurred. The judge went on to find that the CCTV was actually devastating to the case. The case Julie had built was so strong, the judge said she didn't even need to hear the claimant's verbal evidence. The judge was not fooled by their lies. Three of the claimants were found to be fundamentally dishonest and all five claimants were ordered to pay back over £20,000 in costs. Having tried to play the system, all five claimants had lost and were left saddled with a huge debt. Julie hopes this outcome will act as a deterrent to anyone thinking of fabricating a claim. First burst of a zero tolerance approach to anyone submitting spurious claims against a company. Uh, we simply do not pay out on dishonest claims. Still to come, the claim of a sporty young woman who said she could no longer enjoy her favourite activities following a car accident is flipped on its head by her social media posts. Probably the best piece of evidence in the case from our perspective. Uh, footage online of her during the period for which she said she wasn't able to dance, forming these handsprings in a fairly spectacular and impressive fashion. An accident on the road could leave you without the use of your vehicle, in which case you'll need to find a replacement whilst yours is being repaired. If you're not to blame for the accident, credit hire companies can provide that service quickly and with no upfront costs, with the bill charged directly to the insurance company. A good solution for many, but also an opportunity for unscrupulous people to try to scam those companies out of thousands of pounds. One such case involving the driver of a black cab who was caught up in a collision with an HGV landed on the desk of Carl Cripps. He works for Direct Commercial, which offers fleet insurance for HGVs. With more than 30 years' experience, Carl is an expert at sniffing out potentially dodgy claims. The claimant in their black taxi were stopped at traffic lights when, unfortunately, our policyholder collided with the rear of their vehicle. The taxi took quite a battering. The damage to the claimant's vehicle was to the rear end, so the bumper, lights, sensors, etc. Our policyholder's driver exchanged details with the claimant at the accident scene, providing our details for any claim to be submitted. The black cab had come off badly. This crash was going to have a seriously detrimental effect on the taxi driver's livelihood. The damage sustained to the rear of the claimant's vehicle resulted in their vehicle being off the road for a limited period of time. The cabbie needed to find a solution, and quickly. This meant that they would need a hire vehicle whilst their own vehicle was being repaired in order to avoid loss of earnings. Carl was keen to help, but the cabbie had already jumped into action. Our policyholder reported the claim to us immediately after the accident. We attempted to intervene and contact the third party to offer our own repair service, uh, which wasn't accepted as they had proceeded through their own uh, chosen broker or insurer. The cabbie had arranged a replacement vehicle himself through a credit hire company. He'd done this straight away, as every day he was off the road made a serious dent in his income. It's not unusual when a policy holder has a fault accident to receive in a credit hire claim. It's a fairly standard process and one which uh, we will investigate on every and all occasions. 
Credit hire companies generally have a wide range of instantly available replacement vehicles that can be delivered almost anywhere at short notice. This convenience comes with a high price tag, and as the accident wasn't the cabbie's fault, it would be Carl picking up the tab. Higher cases of this nature can mount up to considerable costs fairly quickly. It wasn't long before the cabbie's bill came in. The repairs and credit hire totaled £7,800. At first, everything appeared to be in order. The claim presented for the damage to the black cab was reasonable. They had independent engineering evidence, which was more than acceptable to us. Uh, and the credit hire claim, when initially presented, uh, didn't seem in any way untoward on the costings basis. It was only when Carl took a closer look at the documentation from the credit hire company that he noticed something peculiar. The case really became of a concern when we started to data wash the information that was presented to us, at which point uh, inconsistencies with the evidence became clear. Data washing, also known as data cleansing, involves sifting through all the information provided to make sure there are no inconsistencies. One of the things which is checked is whether other insurance companies have paid out on credit hire. And there, the team came across a huge anomaly. It was during the course of these investigations that we ascertained 13 of the 36 days hire presented to ourselves were for a vehicle that was being hired elsewhere. This meant that for almost two weeks, the same car was also being hired out to someone else at the same time. How could that be possible? In short, it isn't. What is obviously clear is that one vehicle cannot be hired to two people at the same time. The implications were worrying. With these type of inaccuracies, it obviously concerns us with regards to the validity of the whole claim presented from the claimant. Carl started wondering just how honest the cabbie had been about the hire. It did, for us, bring into question whether the taxi driver had hired a vehicle at any point during the process. The accident itself hadn't been in doubt, but the dodgy-looking deal with the credit hire company meant that Carl was not prepared to pay out the extra cost of covering those charges. We returned to the claimant's representatives, informing them that the information before us meant that their credit hire claim was inappropriately presented and therefore we were not going to proceed further with that claim. The cabbie backed down and that was the last Carl and his team heard about the claim for the credit hire. But questions remained. Was it possible that the cabbie could have been working in cahoots with the hire company to make a false claim for thousands of extra pounds? Carl will never know for sure. However, Experience tells him that the withdrawal of the claim was suspicious. Carl agreed to pay for the damage to the taxi, just a fraction of the original claim at £300. I'm delighted to say that we saved over £7,500 for our policyholder. Carl will always remain vigilant to those who might try to pull a fast one. Presenting fraudulent claims does drive up premiums for the innocent motorists and therefore as a business we will do all that we can to fight these claims. In recent years insurers have detected more than a billion pounds worth of dishonest insurance claims a year. Whilst many of these are organised fraud others will be opportunistic. Like in our final case, when a young woman involved in a serious road traffic accident then tried to cash in by exaggerating and inflating her claim. Lawyer Damien Rourke at Clyde & Co was asked to look at a case after a young woman, who was a keen gymnast and dancer, had been involved in a terrible car crash. The accident in question was quite serious and significant. 
One of the vehicles we insured crossed the central reservation and a vehicle containing the claimant approaching in the opposite direction crashed into it at some significant speed. The collision was so severe, it had dreadful consequences. Tragically, the driver who crossed the reservation was killed. As for the young woman in the other car, she received immediate medical attention. An ambulance attended the scene, and the claimant was, in fact, taken to hospital in this case, and she sustained multiple injuries. The young woman was badly injured. The claimant sustained about three years' worth of soft tissue injuries to the neck, shoulder, and specifically to the lower back. Her left knee was injured for a period of about four, four to 10 months, I think. She sustained a significant PTSD injury that lasted about two and a half years. She had cuts and bruises to her lip. I think her wrists were injured as well. It's unusual in a sense to see someone with so many different types of injuries, and that speaks to the seriousness of the crash. The young woman said her injuries had greatly affected the quality of her life, limiting what she was able to do. And as a consequence of these alleged injuries, she was unable to go to the gym. She was unable to work for a short period of time. In addition to that, she was unable to do her dancing and gymnastics, and she was part of a dance troupe. She said that she'd lost the ability to touch her toes, which for a dancer and a gymnast was obviously very significant. Um, she had weakness in her wrist, which was important from the perspective of her being able to do flips. Um, and was generally in a fairly, a fairly poor condition and unable to carry out her previous hobbies. The young woman was claiming for loss of earnings, for pain, suffering and loss of ability, and for around eight weeks of care and assistance that she'd needed immediately after the accident. It all came to a significant payout. We would estimate that the claim was probably worth around 15 to 20,000 pounds. It was clear the young woman had been genuinely injured as a result of the accident. But as her case progressed, Damien started to have concerns that she may be exaggerating her claim, as some things just weren't adding up. You've got a young person in good health, fit and healthy, very fit and healthy, actually, um, and you would anticipate that their recovery would be quick. And in fact, it, it persisted, the injury, and got worse in some instances. Because of her age and fitness levels, the claimant would have been expected to bounce back quickly. Even if she'd been older, Damien would have expected her recovery to have been better than she'd claimed. What tends to happen with the human body, if you're looking at a soft tissue type injury, and all these injuries were, were soft tissue, uh, say for the psychological symptoms, is that you will have an acute period of pain in the first instance, there will be a period of recovery, and those symptoms will either plateau or fade off entirely. Where you would get more and more concerned, I think, is where you have an injury that seems to gradually get worse over time. Because, frankly, that's just not how the human body works. It tends to get better over time, particularly with treatment. The speed of the young woman's recovery wasn't the only thing that had set alarm bells ringing. The claimant was extremely inconsistent over different documents about, you know, how, how long it was she couldn't go to the gym, how long she couldn't dance for, what that looked like in terms of her abilities to return and the level to which she could return in terms of competing or not competing for her dancing. Faced with conflicting information from the claimant, Damien went back to the young woman to ask her to clarify how she'd been affected. When we're presented with a claimant who has particularly vague evidence, we find it's always useful to try to get them to clarify and crystallise that evidence into a narrative. The young woman confirmed in writing that after the accident, she didn't go to the gym for seven months and couldn't dance for ten months. She was also no longer able to do handsprings and said she was only able to socialise with close family and friends. Once Damien and his team had a fully formed version of her limitations, they turned to social media to see if her account was backed up by her online posts. Rather than support her claim, they made Damien sit up and take notice. She was extremely active, the claimant, during the period for which she said she was injured. Those activities were things like going out with her dance troupe and competing in competitions. We found evidence of her paragliding, uh, which is admittedly not the type of activity one would expect to see from someone who was carrying these genuine and significant injuries. 
as well as the paragliding, she'd also been on her travels to Hawaii, Spain, Turkey and Greece. She'd even taken part in a 100-mile walk. Even more concerning, the young woman had been captured on camera doing the one move she'd explicitly said she could no longer do. Probably the best piece of evidence in the case from our perspective, uh, footage online of her during the period for which she said she wasn't able to dance uh, or certainly do handsprings, of her performing these handsprings in a fairly spectacular and impressive fashion. The footage showed someone who was extremely physically capable. The investigators' online searches left the young woman's claim very shaky. Almost everything we found on social media ran contra to the assertions that the claimant had made, very specific assertions in relation to her limitations, which puts you in an awkward position, right? Because there's no doubt that she sustained some sort of genuine injury, but now the claimant reached a tipping point, in our view, whereby we could say that she had been dishonest. With this new evidence, Damien amended his defence to plead a positive case of dishonesty. This meant if the claimant lost at court, she would be found fundamentally dishonest. You can understand why people uh, want to avoid that because it's a matter of public record. They can be put on the insurance fraud register and indeed should be if such a finding is made. Perhaps realising how serious the repercussions would be if she was found fundamentally dishonest, the young woman had a change of heart. She asked us if we would uh, allow her to drop her claim. However, Damien was not comfortable with allowing her to do that in the circumstances. So we asked her to pay our costs of defending the claim, pay the cost of the action. The claimant agreed to pay back around £5,000. By pursuing her exaggerated claim, not only did she end up having to fork out from her own pocket, she also lost the right to claim the genuine settlement she would have been entitled to. It's difficult to, to say what, what extent of her injuries were genuine and how much her claim was worth because she lied about so much. Uh, my estimate would be that her true claim was probably worth somewhere around about £8,000, but instead she tried for around about twenty, and as a consequence lost all of it. Another shocking case of deception and a timely reminder that we all need to remain vigilant to the scourge of insurance fraud. From chances exaggerating injury to criminal gangs engineering crashes for cash, these tricksters hit us all in the pocket. Every year, insurers lose millions to these scams, and it's you, the policyholder, who ends up paying the price in hikes to your premiums. But the sheer number of thieves caught in the act sends a clear message to anyone thinking about cheating the system. They claimed, but now they're shamed. <laughs>